Chapter 8 of The Time Machine by H. G. Wells I found the palace of green porcelain, when we approached it about noon, deserted and falling into ruin. Only ragged vestiges of glass remained in its windows, and great sheets of the green facing had fallen away from the corroded metallic framework. It lay very high upon a turfy down, and looking northeastward before I entered it, I was surprised to see a large estuary, or even creek, where I judged Wandsworth and Battersea must have once been. I thought then, though I never followed up the thought, of what might have happened, or might be happening, to the living things in the sea. The material of the palace proved on examination to be indeed porcelain, and along the face of it I saw an inscription in some unknown character. I thought, rather foolishly, that Weena might help me to interpret this, but I only learned that the bare idea of writing had never entered her head. She always seemed to me, I fancy, more human than she was, perhaps because her affection was so human. Within the big valves of the door, which were open and broken, we found, instead of the customary hall, a long gallery lit by many side windows. At the first glance I was reminded of a museum. The tiled floor was thick with dust, and a remarkable array of miscellaneous objects was shrouded in the same grey covering. Then I perceived, standing strange and gaunt in the centre of the hall, what was clearly the lower part of a huge skeleton. I recognized by the oblique feet that it was some extinct creature after the fashion of the megatherium. The skull and upper bones lay beside it in the thick dust, and in one place, where rainwater had dropped through a leak in the roof, the thing itself had been worn away. Further in the gallery was the huge skeleton barrel of a brontosaurus. My museum hypothesis was confirmed. Going towards the side, I found what appeared to be sloping shelves, and clearing away the thick dust I found the old familiar glass cases of our own time. But they must have been air-tight, to judge from the fair preservation of some of their contents. Clearly, we stood among the ruins of some latter-day South Kensington. Here, apparently, was the paleontological section and a very splendid array of fossils it must have been, though the inevitable process of decay that had been staved off for a time, and had, through the extinction of bacteria and fungi, lost ninety-nine hundredths of its force, was nevertheless with extreme sureness, if with extreme slowness, at work again, upon all its treasures. Here and there I found traces of the little people in the shape of rare fossils broken to pieces, or threaded in strings upon reeds. And the cases had in some instances been bodily removed, by the Morlocks as I judged. The place was very silent. The thick dust deadened our footsteps. Weena, who had been rolling a sea urchin down the sloping glass of a case, presently came, as I stared about me, and very quietly took my hand and stood beside me. And at first, I was so much surprised by this ancient monument of an intellectual age that I gave no thought to the possibilities it presented. Even my preoccupation about the time machine receded a little from my mind. To judge from the size of the place, this palace of green porcelain had a great deal more in it than a gallery of paleontology, possibly historical galleries, it might be even a library. To me, at least in my present circumstances, these would be vastly more interesting than this spectacle of old-time geology in decay. Exploring, I found another short gallery running transversely to the first. This appeared to be devoted to minerals, and the sight of a block of sulphur set my mind running on gunpowder. But I could find no saltpeter. Indeed, no nitrates of any kind. Doubtless, they had deliquesced ages ago. Yet the sulphur hung in my mind, and set up a train of thinking. As for the rest of the contents of that gallery, though on the whole they were the best preserved of all I saw, I had little interest. I am no specialist in mineralogy, 
and I went on down a very ruinous aisle running parallel to the first hall I had entered. Apparently this section had been devoted to natural history, but everything had long since passed out of recognition. A few shriveled and blackened vestiges of what had once been stuffed animals, desiccated mummies in jars that had once held spirit, a brown dust of departed plants, that was all. I was sorry for that, because I should have been glad to trace the patent readjustments by which the conquest of animated nature had been attained. Then we came to a gallery of simply colossal proportions, but singularly ill-lit, the floor of it running downward at a slight angle from the end at which I entered. At intervals white globes hung from the ceiling, many of them cracked and smashed, which suggested that originally the place had been artificially lit. Here I was more in my element, for rising on either side of me were the huge bulks of big machines, all greatly corroded and many broken down, but some still fairly complete. You know, I have a certain weakness for mechanism, and I was inclined to linger among these, the more so, as for the most part they had the interest of puzzles, and I could make only the vaguest guesses at what they were for. I fancied that if I could solve their puzzles I should find myself in possession of powers that might be of use against the Morlocks. Suddenly Weena came very close to my side, so suddenly that she startled me. Had it not been for her I do not think I should have noticed that the floor of the gallery sloped at all. Footnote, it may be, of course, that the floor did not slope, but that the museum was built into the side of a hill. Editor. The end I had come in at was quite above ground, and was lit by rare, slit-like windows. As you went down the length, the ground came up against these windows, until at last there was a pit, like the area of a London house before each, and only a narrow line of daylight at the top. I went slowly along, puzzling about the machines, and had been too intent upon them to notice the gradual diminution of the light, until Weena's increasing apprehensions drew my attention. Then I saw that the gallery ran down at last into a thick darkness. I hesitated, and then, as I looked round me, I saw that the dust was less abundant and its surface less even. Further away towards the dimness, it appeared to be broken by a number of small, narrow footprints. My sense of the immediate presence of the Morlocks revived at that. I felt that I was wasting my time in the academic examination of machinery. I called to mind that it was already far advanced in the afternoon, and that I had still no weapon, no refuge, and no means of making a fire. And then, down in the remote blackness of the gallery, I heard a peculiar pattering, and the same odd noises I had heard down the well. I took Weena's hand. Then, struck with a sudden idea, I left her and turned to a machine from which projected a lever not unlike those in a signal box. Clambering up the stand and grasping this lever in my hands, I put all my weight upon it sideways. Suddenly Weena, deserted in the central aisle, began to whimper. I had judged the strength of the lever pretty correctly, for it snapped after a minute's strain, and I rejoined her with a mace in my hand more than sufficient, I judged, for any Morlock skull I might encounter. And I longed very much to kill a Morlock or so. Very inhuman, you may think, to want to go killing one's own descendants. But it was impossible, somehow, to feel any humanity in the things. Only my disinclination to leave Weena, and a persuasion that if I began to slake my thirst for murder, my time machine might suffer, restrained me from going straight down the gallery and killing the brutes I heard. Well, mace in one hand and Weena in the other, I went out of that gallery and into another and still larger one, which, at the first glance, reminded me of a military chapel hung with tattered flags. The brown and charred rags that hung from the sides of it I presently recognized as the decaying vestiges of books. They had long since dropped to pieces, and every semblance of print had left them. But here and there were warped boards and cracked metallic clasps 
that told the tale well enough. Had I been a literary man, I might, perhaps, have moralized upon the futility of all ambition. But as it was, the thing that struck me with the keenest force was the enormous waste of labor to which this somber wilderness of rotting paper testified. At the time, I will confess that I thought chiefly of the philosophical transactions and my own seventeen papers upon physical optics. Then, going up a broad staircase, we came to what may once have been a gallery of technical chemistry, and here I had not a little hope of useful discoveries. Except at one end, where the roof had collapsed, this gallery was well preserved. I went eagerly to every unbroken case, and at last, in one of the really airtight cases, I found a box of matches. Very eagerly I tried them. They were perfectly good. They were not even damp. I turned to Weena. Dance! I cried to her in her own tongue, for now I had a weapon indeed against the horrible creatures we feared. And so, in that derelict museum, upon the thick soft carpeting of dust, to Weena's huge delight, I solemnly performed a kind of composite dance, whistling the land of the leal as cheerfully as I could. In part it was a modest can-can, in part a step-dance, in part a skirt-dance, so far as my tail-coat permitted, and in part original. For I am naturally inventive, as you know. Now, I still think that for this box of matches to have escaped the wear of time for immemorial years was most strange. As for me, it was a most fortunate thing. Yet, oddly enough, I found a far unlikelier substance, and that was camphor. I found it in a sealed jar, that by chance, I suppose, had been really hermetically sealed. I fancied at first that it was paraffin wax, and smashed the glass accordingly. But the odor of camphor was unmistakable. In the universal decay, this volatile substance had chanced to survive, perhaps through many thousands of centuries. It reminded me of a sepia painting I had once seen done from the ink of a fossil belemnite that must have perished and become fossilized millions of years ago. I was about to throw it away, but I remembered that it was inflammable and burned with a good bright flame, was in fact an excellent candle, and I put it in my pocket. I found no explosives, however, nor any means of breaking down the bronze doors. As yet, my iron crowbar was the most helpful thing I had chanced upon. Nevertheless, I left that gallery greatly elated. I cannot tell you all the story of that long afternoon. It would require a great effort of memory to recall my explorations in at all the proper order. I remember a long gallery of rusting stands of arms, and how I hesitated between my crowbar and a hatchet or a sword. I could not carry both, however, and my bar of iron promised best against the bronze gates. There were numbers of guns, pistols, and rifles, and most were masses of rust, but many were of some new metal, and still fairly sound. But any cartridges or powder there may once have been had rotted into dust. One corner I saw was charred and shattered, perhaps, I thought, by an explosion among the specimens. In another place was a vast array of idols, Polynesian, Mexican, Grecian, Phoenician, every country on earth, I should think. And here, yielding to an irresistible impulse, I wrote my name upon the nose of a steatite monster from South America that particularly took my fancy. As the evening drew on, my interest waned. I went through gallery after gallery, dusty, silent, often ruinous, the exhibit sometimes mere heaps of rust and lignite, sometimes fresher. In one place I suddenly found myself near the model of a tin mine, and then, by the merest accident, I discovered, in an airtight case, two dynamite cartridges. I shouted, Eureka! and smashed the case with joy. Then came a doubt. I hesitated. Then, selecting a little side-gallery, I made my essay. 
I never felt such a disappointment as I did in waiting five, ten, fifteen minutes for an explosion that never came. Of course, the things were dummies, as I might have guessed from their presence. I really believe that, had they not been so, I should have rushed off incontinently and blown sphinx, bronze doors, and, as it proved, my chances of finding the time-machine altogether into non-existence. It was after that, I think, that we came to a little open court within the palace. It was turfed and had three fruit-trees. So we rested and refreshed ourselves. Toward sunset I began to consider our position. Night was creeping upon us, and my inaccessible hiding-place had still to be found. But that troubled me very little now. I had in my possession a thing that was perhaps the best of all defences against the Morlocks. I had matches. I had the camphor in my pocket, too, if a blaze were needed. It seemed to me that the best thing we could do would be to pass the night in the open, protected by a fire. In the morning there was the getting of the time-machine. Towards that, as yet, I had only my iron mace. But now, with my growing knowledge, I felt very differently towards those bronze doors. Up to this I had refrained from forcing them, largely because of the mystery on the other side. They had never impressed me as being very strong, and I hoped to find my bar of iron not altogether inadequate for the work. End of chapter 8